Good to see everyone. Uh, special live today because everyone was asking about it. You guys want to see the cool airway tools that we use, and I am super excited to show you the video bronchoscope here. That um, it's so cool. This is literally a life-saving tool, and I'm going to bring you guys nice and close so you can see what it looks like and how we can uh, help prevent airway catastrophes from happening in the operating room. So as much as I love talking about the natural things, and dude, I love that stuff, and it's great, and I'm happy to answer questions on that if you have any, but today we're gonna talk about, because I have one of these around, what the video bronchoscope is like and how this can be one of the most powerful, life-saving tools in the operating room. Hey, Heidi, good to see you again. I love it, I love it. Um, can you actually see your comment here on the screen? <laughs> there you go, so I'm, yep, yep. So it's a camera, picture in picture, literally. Shireen, good to see you. Pat, Anna, oh, Anna, hi from Hawaii. I am so jealous of you. I am super jealous. Okay, how are bougies used in difficult intubations? Well, we can talk about that. Let me talk about this first, and we'll talk about bougies. We'll talk about anything you want, um, because this is your opportunity to ask me whatever you want, guys. Board certified, Harvard Stanford trained anesthesiologist here to answer your questions, so take advantage of it. Um, Tom, good to see you. Uh, oh, Shireen, can you see my video on tasting propofol? We'll talk about that. We can talk about that too. I got no shortage of propofol here to demonstrate. Um, not on myself, obviously. Okay, bad wake-ups we'll talk about, and you need anesthetics for a colonoscopy. Well, Dora, short answer is no to your question. Okay, guys, uh, one second pause for the question. So this is this, the bronchoscope I was talking to you about. When, we, when you're usually going to sleep, remember, you get the mask on, you get oxygen in your lungs, then you stop breathing because all of our medications do that. Even the ancient anesthesia medications, once you get enough of them in your body, you will stop breathing. Now, we're going to place a breathing tube to support your breathing when you stop breathing on your own. That's why we have the fancy ventilators and stuff, right? So, we have breath different breathing tubes. Some of them look like this. This one, you don't use with this. Bronchoscopes and LMAs, for the most part, don't mix together. But what we do use are the endotracheal tubes. We literally slide the bronchoscope over this tube, and then we put this in the back of your mouth. We put it down your mouth until we see your vocal cords. And then when we see your vocal cords, we put it past. We have to put this little, look how thin it is. It's very thin, right? We put this past your vocal cords, then we slide the endotracheal tube past your vocal cords and watching all of it on a not quite 4K display, but on something that's much better than what we had in the past. When I was training, I had to look in this little scope thing and it was like, you literally had to, it was like looking in a kind of a really, really um, crummy quality microscope. And you're like looking down this thing, trying to like adjust. You see how I'm adjusting this with my thumb? You had to look, down like this into something and with your thumb try to adjust and you rotate and do all these maneuvers but nowadays it's connected to a little monitor here this is so much easier i can see what i'm doing without having to squint my eyes looking like a pirate looking at a ship you know off in the distance i just look at the screen total game changer now why do i do this why do we have this so i said earlier if we can't place the breathing tube because we can't see your vocal cords then we got to go into something that gives us a better visualization and sometimes we do this in patients who are awake or at least not fully asleep and that's because th this is much more comfortable to put in your mouth than the traditional laryngoscope like i was showing you guys earlier which is this guy this in your mouth is very uncomfortable this is a more comfortable version but it's still not comfortable and we contrast that with this little skinny guy. This little skinny guy is not nearly as uncomfortable as that other one I showed you. All right, and then we can visualize everything just like how you can see yourselves right now and your comments on that screen. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Okay, anything else you wanna see about this bronchoscope before I put it away? Let's put this back in here. Okay, cool. What other, quite, so many comments that I haven't seen here, okay. How are bougies used? Okay, well, we can talk about bougies. Um, I always carry a bougie with me. <laughs> kind of funny, right? Um, I will show you bougies. Do you guys want to talk about bougies? I keep one for demonstration purposes whenever I'm teaching things. 
This is a bougie, all right? We similarly put this inside the endotracheal tube and can use this to pop. This guy goes right past the vocal cords, then we thread the endotracheal tube over it so it gets in contact with your lung tissue so we can breathe for you. We then connect that to the ventilator like the one next to me. Happy to show it to you if you want, but this is a bougie, comes from, where does the word bougie come from? I'll give you a massive shout out if you know where bougie comes from. Um, but anyway, Seth, I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, Shireen, do we want to talk about smelling propofol? Let's do it, Shireen. So, whenever you, when you eat garlic, right, why do you have garlic breath after you eat garlic? Why? Because you've eaten something, it gets absorbed by your intestines, it goes into all your blood vessels in your body, those blood vessels come to your lungs. And then it releases garlic smell into your lungs and you breathe that out. You know, did you know, that, did you know that you can get garlic and rub it up in your hands, put a glove on your hand, and wait and see how long it takes for you to start smelling garlic. When you exhale that stuff, you might smell it, but sure, other people around you will smell it as well. Because the garlic can get absorbed through the palms of your hands or the soles of your feet, wherever. So, you're breathing out that stuff. Now, the same thing goes for things like IV medications that we give in. We give them into your IV, they go into your body, they go past your lungs, and then you exhale those things out. So you might taste it because smell and taste are so closely related, or other people might smell them. All right, Shireen, I hope that answered your question. What, a bad wake up, do we 900 or 9,000 rather? Bad wake ups happen from many things. They're not the same as bad trips. No, 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 they're not. Uh, they can be, but usually it's from other things going on. I'm going to put the bougie away, but hold on. Did anyone answer where the term bougie comes from? No one said where bougie comes from. Oh, Seth. Hey, hey. Yeah, so Seth is right. It comes from French. Bougie means candle in French. So the original bougies were made out of wax, like wax candles, and that's where the name bougie comes from. All right. Not from being bougie or anything. <laughs> I'm not a bougie person, you know, I'm not, <laughs> not from that kind of bougie. It comes from the term for candle. Right. Let me bring this up a little bit higher here. Oh, there we go. Um, there's so many questions. Do you still want me to connect myself to the monitors to do some biofeedback training? You guys let me know. Um, you guys let me know. What other questions have we got? Hey, Brenda, good to see you. Dora asks, I have to be put out to have cataract surgery. Would I be intubated at that point? I have never put anyone out for cataract surgery. I just do very light sedation with the medications that I've shown you before. I've never intubated somebody for a cataract. Uh, just because you can't really do that because the patient needs to be awake enough so that their eyes can move where their ophthalmologist is doing the lens replacement. So if you're out cold, you can't control your eye movement. That's why I've never done that before. Stalwart, good to see you on here. Why doesn't morphine and anesthetic work properly on me? I have, red, I have a redhead mother. I don't think it has much to do with it. Even local anesthetics take about 3x the typical dose. Stalwart, I have a bunch of videos on this, but there's a handful of things that cause increased anesthesia requirements by your brain. The most common is going to be um, medication and substance use. So people that use substances like marijuana, people that drink alcohol, chronically are going to have a higher requirement for anesthesia because they simply act on similar receptors. So your brain upregulates those receptors, we believe, so that you need more of it to get the same effect. Anxiety can also increase the amount of anesthesia you need. Not by a ton, ton, but definitely more than not being anxious. Red, head, red hair, about 20% increase for some agents like sevoflurane, but otherwise it's um, comes down to probably some factors that we don't know about yet. Um, secondly, it could also be um, body weight. And um, those are the main, the main ones. So I'm just looking out at the windows, make sure people don't need me for anything. <laughs> We're good. Did, did that answer your question? Um, hypernatremia can cause it. Uh, those are the main ones. Some things lower your anesthesia needs. Being pregnant lowers the amount of anesthesia that you need, for example. Good. Body temperature also affects it. Uh, Brenda, thank you so much for the kind comments. Um, in the OR as I'm not. Uh, 
Mabel, do I have any tips on how to not freak out when I have my jaw surgery? Mabel, I wish you the best of luck for your jaw surgery. I am actually editing a video later today on exactly what you're talking about. It's going to be on the topic of surgery panic attacks. So Mabel, I'm going to respectfully um, punt that question because I have the whole video that I'm going through. It's about certain supplements that are safe uh, for the right patients, of course. Um, mind-body techniques, aromatherapies, etc. that help patients not freak out because I don't want my patients to freak out because then they're more likely to wake up with that bad wake up like we were talking about earlier. All right, so um, check out that video. I will go into so much depth about that. I am very excited that you asked. Um, Rainbow Zebra, <laughs> hey, good to see you on here. Um, okay. Dora White has congenital nystagmus. I see that's why you're being put out. Well, if you're being put out fully, then you might get a breathing tube. I don't know how deep you need to be, but I suspect something like this would suffice, or maybe even you breathing on your own, depending on whether you have sleep apnea or not. Mabel, you're asking a good question about anesthesia gases. This is the most common one that we use. I don't like to use it though. This one's called sevofluoride. I don't like to use anesthesia gas very much because it's bad for the environment. And patients don't like the feeling of it. It just feels kind of like nauseating and not ideal. That's why I like to actually use IV agents because they're far better for the environment and less nausea overall. So I hope that answers your question. Xenon is also one that I have personally never, ever used. Um, so I don't know how it smells. Okay. Uh, Stalwart says, I'm nine stone and don't use substances or rank much. We only found out that after a skull damage, you needed high doses. It never used to be an issue with local. Stalwart, I don't know why you personally have higher anesthesia requirements. You got me on that. It's, you don't fall into a typical category. I do wonder what medications specifically you have higher requirements for. Because that's also a whole thing. Is it like you need more sevoflurane, like from the ventilator that you saw behind me? Is it more of the white stuff like propofol, more ketamine, more etomidate? Is it more light local anesthetic like lidocaine? It all depends, which is why I really can't give an answer without knowing more about the specific situation. Um, okay. My grandma was a redhead. No one else. I am not. Uh, Pascal, good to see you on here. You don't need to inform your anesthesiologist if your grandmother was. Um, because remember, we're not going to treat you just for having red hair. We're going to treat you as a, as a patient, as a, <laughs> your own independent human being. And we titrate all of our medications based on um, how your body is reacting to the anesthesia. So when you come in this operating room here, we will tailor it to you specifically. At least that's what I do. I, I hope that's what every other doctor does out there. I hope that answers your question. Okay. <sighs> Mabel has Tetralogy of Fallot. I can't, yeah, yeah, that can be tough to have propofol, Mabel. Um, maybe they had to use smaller doses of it. Yeah, that, that's a very niche, niche situation, Mabel. I'm wishing you the best of luck for that, by the way. I hope everyone else here is giving you positive energy as well. Okay, Jill, or no, B triple D. What do you think about the Ramadan? Reading is from the Netherlands. Oh, <laughs> well, we can talk about that um, offline if you like. Um, many potential positives about it. Jill says, any thoughts on going into the, oh, thoughts on going into the field of dental anesthesia? I don't know what dental anesthesia is really, I mean, in the United States, when you're an anesthesiologist, you do anesthesia for everything, so it's not just dental or just this or just that. Um, Shireen says that she needs more propofol, midazolam, and fentanyl. Wow, well, Shireen, you definitely hit all the big ones there. I wonder what other medical conditions you have. You don't have to share if you're uncomfortable, but that's pretty, uh, it's a lot of high requirements there. Stalwart, are there studies that would help others if people joined for these types of things to increase understanding? Stalwart, there are many studies. I cite them in my website. So you can go to medicalsecretsmd.com and I go through, um, I, they're all little HREFs. If you know what I mean, you just click the, they're just there on my blogs that cite to the original articles for these. So please check those out. Um, if you're doubting the veracity of what I'm saying, please, you can read the primary literature for yourself and come to your own conclusion. <laughs> um, anesthesia assistance. Oh my gosh, Seth, I, that's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> Political issue I'm not going to go into right now, but I think that there is a role for many people who want to be involved in the operating room 
with the right education. Uh, don't mean to punch that, but yeah, we don't talk politics on this channel. The difference between a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist and a regular anesthesiologist. Uh, many things. If you're PD cardiac, it means you've done a fellowship in peds and at least done some extra training in cardiac, meaning that you do stuff with like open heart surgery, bypass machines and all that. Um, unfortunately, guys, I have neither a pediatric, a pediatric anesthesiologist nor a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist. I deal with adults um, and I specifically do a lot of regional anesthesia. So nerve blocks are my main gig. I did do my fellowship in integrative medicine, and that's looking at the combination of Eastern and Western medicinal practices and putting them all together. So that's my specialty, specifically, and how do we bring the best of Western medicine, everything you see here in this operating room, stuff that saves lives in the ER and the OR, and then combining that with ancient practices, acupuncture, botanicals, um, you name it. There's so many ancient practices that people have been using for you know, thousands, millennia. Um, how do we find the way of bringing them all together? That's my MO, that's my specialty training. Um, all right. Uh, oh, Shireen, I'm so sorry about all of your back problems. Oh my gosh, that seems so rough. I'm sorry. Um, Pascal, I wish you the best, by the way, for your surgery coming up. And can I talk about blood gases? Andrew, uh, I, I can, but I would like a little bit more specifics about what you're getting at. Tell me what specifically you want to know about blood gases, otherwise it's simply too broad of a topic. I will, since we're here, um, <laughs> connect myself to the monitor, and hey, if you guys are learning something, remember, please share with others, and let me know uh, what else you want, to, you want to see my videos on. You can comment on any videos that I have, uh, and I will answer those comments as well if I can't answer them here on this live. Uh, but the next one that I'm going to film as soon as we're done is going to be on the different airway equipment. Um, the different breathing tubes, you saw the fiber optic scope earlier, the video laryngoscope. I'm so excited to film that because everyone was asking for it. Um, all right. Do we talk about neuropathy? Uh, ad view, ad view life. Hey, um, in this session we haven't talked about neuropathy. Neuropathy in the operating room mostly comes up when I'm doing things with medications like this. Let's see, can you guys see that? Called, this is called ropivacaine. It's not, I'm not sure, maybe this one will work. Or lidocaine. Ah! So these medications block sodium channels and nerves. It's all fuzzy. I'm sorry, guys. Maybe if I get out of the way. There you go. So if I come in the picture, it focuses on my face. But if I leave the picture, Okay, well anyways, you get the idea. Ropivacaine and lidocaine um, affect nerves, and if you have neuropathy, we, there is a risk for what's called a double hit hypothesis, double crush hypothesis, where if you have pre-existing nerve problems, additional local anesthetics might cause further nerve problems, which is why we take it very seriously. That's my, um, how I interact with neuropathy. There's also neuropathy leading to autonomic dysfunction, Things like gastroparesis have severe consequences in the operating room. And then the worst of all is, and this is like the worst, right? We never really want to go into this one. The worst is um, when you have autonomic dysfunction. So if your heart, if your autonomic nervous system has a neuropathy and you don't have, you can't maintain your heart rate, those things can be dangerous in the operating room. I can connect myself to the monitor, but I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll just knock out a couple more questions and then we'll save this one for a different, uh, different live. Does that sound good? Uh, but yeah, neuropathy is very, very problematic if it affects your autonomic nervous system. Okay, uh, Andrew Gillett is asking about just the basics. So let me, let me give you the basics, Andrew, by connecting myself to a monitor. Because you know how I, how I roll. I roll by you guys learning stuff from me, hopefully, on my body. So it demystifies things. And then hopefully, if any of you guys are anxious or nervous or scared about surgery, you won't be. So I'm going to... I have an oxygen mask here, okay? I'm going to plug it in to the mass spectrometer here. So check it out. This will be fun. This will be fun. Blood gases are very important parts of uh, anesthesia and critical care. Okay, so that's in. That's in.
All right. Thanks for your patience, guys. I just got to get this little demo ready for you. And I think this will be maybe our last demo of the day. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So, I got my mask on here. Okay. Good. So, let's bring it in, guys. When I am breathing through this mask, you guys can see, in a second, my carbon dioxide coming out. Uh, of course, now it decides to... There we go. Okay. So, do you see me breathing here? There's a number next to it. The number says 34. So, that is... Proportional to how much carbon dioxide I'm breathing out for you guys. Now, the amount of carbon dioxide that I breathe out is correlated to my blood pH. My blood pH is what we want to know when we're looking at blood gases. So I can control my blood pH, my acidity, by how much I breathe. And this is what we have to do with your body under anesthesia. We're constantly manipulating your blood's ABG, your blood gas. And we do it primarily by changing your breathing with the ventilator which we follow with the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out, like you see right here. Of course, see, there we go. This is me breathing out right now. That red going up and down. Does that make sense? That's the basic most thing about it. All right, CO2 traces, Andrew. That's 100% correct. Okay, so uh, almost there. I didn't follow your question there about pain relief. I'm sorry. Uh, Breathing control and self-regulation can help so much with pain relief. Yes, stalwart. That's what actually my, my next video is on. I connected myself to the monitors the other day. I did a full-on demo, and it'll be on there for everyone to watch as a reference. I'm super excited to edit it today. Okay. Hey, RJA World, good to see you. Guys, I am going to... Um, I am going to... I think we're going to have to quit right now. I, you guys are asking such great questions. I need to record my next video. Um, so I'm really excited to do that. It's going to be on the different airway stuff that we talked about. Remember, this is the most natural anesthesia without any breathing tubes. But you sometimes need the breathing tubes if you have to be in a deeper sleep where you're not breathing on your own. And that's where that fiber optic scope comes in. So that's what I'm going to do that video on. So you guys inspired me to do that video. I'm going to film it right now. Maybe in the next couple of days I'll have it, um, <laughs> I'll have it edited for you guys so you guys can uh, see what that fiber optic scope and the video laryngoscope and all the other things look like. I think you guys are going to love it. And so uh, remember that until then, you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. And um, keep up the learning and be sure to share what you've learned with other people today. And uh, yeah, comment and subscribe to keep up with all my videos. Until then, take care.